Uh, he has two acclaimed books, uh, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case of Liberty, and he has his latest book, The Islamic Jesus, How the King of the Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslim. In addition, he regularly writes for numerous uh, media outlets, including the New York Times, and also a El Monitor, in addition to appearing on numerous uh, uh, TV shows, different things, um, which include uh, CNN. So without further ado, I'll have Mustafa come up here and uh, welcome, give him a warm welcome to Broken College. And he will speak until about uh, 3 o'clock, and then there'll be plenty of times, 3, 3.15 or 3.10, uh, and there'll be plenty of times for uh, questions and answers after that and comments. Okay, there you go. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise, for this very generous, kind introduction. Uh, thanks to Brooklyn College for really hosting me so kindly and graciously and bringing me from Boston uh, earlier this morning. And thanks to you all for coming to this event. I'm sure there are more fun things to do out there in New York City at this moment, but we prefer to be here. Thanks for that. Uh, we've been friends with Louise for years, but actually this is the first time we met in person. So in that sense, it's been a great opportunity. We've been friends through, you know, internet and uh, Twitter and messages and all that, but uh, it's a great chance and uh, really, uh, I'm, I'm happy for that as well. I'm currently based in Wellesley College, which is, you know, just outside of Boston since January 2011, but I'm originally from Turkey. So I was born in Ankara, I was raised in Istanbul, so Turkey is my home. I lived there for 40-something uh, years, which is going to show my age. Um, and, well, Turkey's not going through great days these days, but I'm not going to talk to you about that, you know, that's a different political matter. I want to tell you something else. Um, I want to tell you about the history of Islam, about the history of my civilization, and that's a topic obviously you can write encyclopedias about. So I'm just giving you some highlights about, which might you know provoke some uh, some rethinking of some of the current issues today. But I want to begin uh, even before that uh, with a story, with a personal story of mine. As I said, I'm Turkish. I grew up in Turkey. Uh, and actually, this is only the longest stay, I mean, this current one is the, that I have in the U.S. for 15 months. But I've traveled to the U.S. dozens of times in the past two decades for conferences, for events, and I've always went back with some nice stories. But the very first story I had was in the very first trip, and I, I always, you know, thought it was an interesting experience, so I want to share, you with that, share that with you. This was in the year 1998. And then I was a younger man, and I was excited to see America, right in the land of Rocky Balboa for me. And maybe, maybe you're too young to know who Rocky Balboa was, but in my age, he was a big guy, you know, boxer, hero, you know, American films, and, and I wanted to see, you know, America and then all that, and I came here to visit a friend of mine who's, who knows, you know, who already lived in the U.S., so he showed me places. We went from New York to California. One morning we were really hungry, and he said, let's have breakfast. I said, sure, let's have breakfast. So he took me, he said, let's go to McDonald's. I said, like, we'll eat burgers for breakfast? He said, no, no, McDonald's has breakfast menu. I said, okay, let me see what that is. So we walked in, and he bought me a full breakfast menu, and he gave it to me, and I looked at it, and that was the first time in my life that I saw Pancakes. You don't have pancakes in Turkey in the menu. Maybe I didn't see them. We had even if you had. So he showed me how to put the syrup and the butter, and it sucked all of it, and I tasted it, and I said, "Man, this is the most delicious thing I ever had in my life." I immediately fell in love with pancakes, and I went back to Turkey. And next summer, I came to the U.S. again, and. I was eager to eat pancakes, right? But I had a little misunderstanding. I was thinking that pancakes are an exclusive McDonald's product. <laughs> so I was trying to find a McDonald's restaurant before 10.30 a.m. because I figured out that they change into lunch menu at 10.30 to get the pancakes, right? 
It went on for a few days, and I think it was on the third day I was in Manhattan, New York, walking around, and I saw, I was looking for a McDonald's restaurant. I saw a non-McDonald's restaurant, <coughs> which wrote, we serve pancakes. I said, ah, uh, they stole it from McDonald's. <laughs> Ultimately, I figured out that, you know, pancakes are a larger phenomenon than McDonald's itself, and, you know, you can find them everywhere. I had many good pancakes uh, thanks to that, but years later I also took a lesson from that story. And the lesson was that a foreign culture might be a little confusing when you meet it for the first time. And if it is the cuisine, that confusion is easy, you'll figure out. You'll figure out baklava's pancakes, it's not that difficult. But if you have misperceptions about the culture, the values, the history, the religion of a different society, a whole different civilization, that might be a bigger problem sometimes to solve. That might be a bigger gap to fill. And uh, I also believe that at this day and age in the modern world, in the 21st century, we are very prone to have misperceptions about different cultures. Why? Well, on the one hand, we actually get so much information about different cultures every day. You go, you turn on your TV, and you get breaking news. Like, you turn on channels like very liberal ones like Fox News, as I understand. <laughs> uh, so you get breaking news from all corners of the world. You hear amazing things. I mean, you hear from Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, you know, Syria, Iraq, places you have never been to. But... Be careful, you're always hearing the shocking, the disturbing, the bloody, the bad stuff that's going on out there. Uh, and in these countries, there are indeed these big troubles, there are terrorists, there are radical groups, there are militants. They produce the news, but there are so many other people who just live their ordinary, not ordinary lives. There are so many other people who actually don't agree with those people, who are actually threatened by those people, but they don't create headlines. So they don't shape your image about those societies. So this is a dynamic which is, I think, creating a negative view of Islam in the U.S. in the past couple of decades, especially since 9-11, when that horrific day and 3,000 innocent Americans were killed by ruthless terrorists acting in the name of Islam, but not certainly in the name of the majority of Muslims, and they were a marginal group. But let me tell you one more thing. This dynamic is working on the other side as well. In other words, when people hear news from this side of the world in the other side of the world, they don't hear the nicest, most tolerant and liberal you know, narratives that are out there. They also hear the shocking and the disturbing. Uh, like one example, in 2013, I made a research to figure out which American religious leader appeared most frequently in the Turkish media, so therefore shaped the image of an American religious leader. The research, uh, which I will admit was a simple one, it was a Google search that lasted for five seconds. I just typed the word pastor in Turkish, to figure out which comes up most frequently. And it turned out that it was this guy from Florida who wanted to burn a copy of the Quran, Mr. Terry Jones. And it is a constitutional right, I understand that, but you can use your constitutional rights in a respectful way, you can use them in an offensive way, you use it in an offensive way. The most important thing is that a lot of mainstream Christian, Jewish, or other religious leaders criticized his, his position. They said you shouldn't do that. He did, but he created headlines. I remember waking up in Istanbul and seeing on a prominently Islamic or Islamist website, now they are burning our Quran. It was not they, it was just a guy in the middle of nowhere in a head of a small denomination, but he created an image. So this dynamic is tearing us societies apart and creating misperceptions. And we look at the other side, see the most radical elements there, and get an image about that society. And there are even talking heads saying that, oh yes, that's, that's who they are. You know, that, that's the best representative of that civilization, actually. The others are hiding it. No, it's not that simple, and it's not really that caricaturish, that world of us. That is why I believe in not having these negative stereotypes and poking through them. I believe in having conversations, having dialogues. 
And that's why I'm glad you know, we're having such a conversation here today. Now, so I'll speak about a little bit about Islam and pluralism and why it's a lost heritage. I'll say a few things about that as well. And I will begin by taking you to briefly through the slides, of course, uh, to two important cities on Earth and just remind a few things about them. Uh, two important big significant cities. One of them is probably the most sacred city on earth, which is Jerusalem. Uh, now, some of you have might have been to Jerusalem. If you haven't been to, I strongly <coughs> recommend visiting. It's the most fascinating city, I think, on earth. Sacred for the three major religions. Um, and if you go to Jerusalem, you'll probably, you know, have some fun in the, you know, more modern part, and ultimately you'll go to the old city, and you will see the religious sites and everything you'll pass through some gate. And one of those gates that most people pass through is the Jaffa Gate. Have you passed through the Jaffa Gate? So, I mean, maybe you passed through, maybe you don't know, but if you go to Jerusalem, you'll, there are a few major gates you'll pass through. A lot of people pass through there, a lot of tourists go there. But so every, people walk there, right? Few people notice an inscription just on the left side of the wall when you're passing through the Jaffa Gate. It is this inscription. Oh, this is the Jaffa Gate story. And yeah, on the left side of the wall, there is an Arabic inscription. Uh, and it writes, La ilaha illallah Ibrahim Khalilullah. Which means, there is no God but God, and Abraham is his friend. Now, probably the Muslims in the audience are, oh yes, that's what we, I mean, La ilaha illallah, we all know that, right? That's the basic motto of Islam. But it typically continues, La ilaha illallah Muhammad and Rasulullah. Like, there's no God but God, and Muhammad is a messenger. That's the motto of Islam. Saying that out loud makes you a Muslim. But here, it doesn't mention Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, not out of any disrespect, but probably for some other reason. It is emphasizing something else. There is no God but God, and Abraham is his friend. Now, this inscription was put up here by the Ottomans in the 16th century. The walls of the city were built by the Ottoman Empire and under the Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. And uh, they actually built the city walls and gave us the basic design of the you know, old city today. And they put up this inscription, and we don't have a record why, explaining why they chose to write this, but I have a sense, and that is, Abraham is sacred for everybody who goes to Jerusalem. I mean, unless you're a secular person or you're from, uh, from a different tradition, which will be all respected, of course, too. But <coughs> Abraham is sacred for Muslims, yes. It's sacred for Christians, obviously. And, of course, it is sacred for Jews. So, because Muslims, Christians, and Jews are Abrahamists. They all honor Abraham as, as their founding father of their traditions. So, it was, I think, wise to put up Abraham as a signal to the Jaffa Gate, as a, like a uh, emphasis. And the Ottomans just did not put up this inscription, but they, as I said, you know, basically designed the neighborhoods of, which were there, but they just you know, structured more. The old city of Jerusalem, you can see this in a map. When you enter from the main gate, you know, the Jaffa Gate actually here, and I, I don't, yeah, my finger doesn't show that here, but, so the arrow, you will see that, uh, you pass through, you come to the Armenian quarter, the Christian quarter, well, the Armenians are Christian too, but they have their own space, and in the Christian quarter, you typically have the Orthodox and the Catholics. And then you come to the Jewish quarter and the Muslim quarter. So these are four neighborhoods in the old city, and these neighborhoods are there for centuries, and still under the you know, rule of Israel today too, these neighborhoods exist. And these neighborhoods existed together as Abrahamic communities under the Ottoman times. And it even goes back to early, before the Ottomans, the Fumar as well. And we also know that under the Ottoman Empire, all these religious communities had access to their places of worship. Uh, Jews had the access to worship in the Western world. Uh, we know this, for example, from the writings of some travelers. One of them was a European rabbi named Joseph Schwartz. He has this interesting book, Descriptive Geography of the Brief Historical and Brief Historical Sketch of Palestine, which is a book fully available online. And there he says, when he goes to the uh, old city, 
he speaks about the Western world, and he says, no one is molested in these visits by the Mohammedans, which was a term used by, for Muslims by the Europeans at the time, which is not technically correct, but anyway. And he says, as we have a very old firman from the Sultan of Constantinople, that the approach shall not be denied to us. And, and there also there's a text for it, it's quite in, insignificant, he adds. We also have photos taken in the late 19th century of Jewish people uh, freely pra praying at the Western Wall, uh, such as this photo. Now, this was the norm. However, this Muslim tolerance and respect to Jewish customs died out, unfortunately, in 1948 because of the first Arab-Israeli war. And Jews were banned from praying in Western Wall. And Jews started praying again in Western World in 1967 when Israel took the city. And that's, of course, wonderful. Uh, but the city remains a contested city. And, you know, the whole land uh, over Israel-Palestine, you know, is a contested issue. And I think Muslims themselves lost some of the tolerance they had back in the Ottoman Empire. And I think the whole region lost some of the multicultural, multi-religious heritage it had since then. That is why... The Arab communities that existed, uh, sorry, the Jewish communities in, that existed in the Arab nations around Palestine, from Morocco to Syria to Iraq, have been largely eradicated after 1947 because of the conflicts and, and the, all the passions and wrong passions that stirred up. So we should today criticize all these biases, anti-Semitism, and all the intolerance, but we should remember that, oh, there was a time that you know, people could actually worship together without seeing each other as enemies. Now, this is one city, Jerusalem. I told you two cities. The other one is my city, Istanbul. And I'll show you less about that. Well, this is one fancy photo of our own old city, Istanbul, the great uh, Suleymaniye Mosque. And uh, Istanbul is bigger than Jerusalem. It is a huge city of 14 million people. Um, and one thing about Istanbul is that today it is a basically Turkish Muslim city. I mean, there are Kurdish Muslims too, but I mean, the majority of people who live in Istanbul are Muslim Turks or Muslim Kurds or Muslims. Well, Istanbul was more cosmopolitan some time ago, a century ago. Uh, we have a lot of actually anecdotes about this. You know, we have archival records of populations, but I just want to give you a quote from a Christian statesman from Poland and Protestant theologian who went to Istanbul a century ago, Abraham Kuyper. He was a, uh, he was a Calvinist prominent theologian in Poland who was going to be the prime minister. He lost it, but he was a prominent politician as well. Anyway, he traveled the whole Muslim world a century ago, more than a century ago, like early 20th century. And he wrote this book on Islam, which is recently translated into English. And I just it, like reviewed this book for the Acton Institute, which translated and published the book. So there, and this is the original uh, book he published in Holland way back. There he says, he went back, he went to Istanbul, and he says, Constantinople is an international metropolis in a unique sense. All the followers of Islam, Turks and Arabs together, total less than half of its population. So all Muslims in Istanbul made half of, less than half of the population. He speaks of Jews, he speaks of uh, Christians of different sorts, Ar Orthodox Armenians, and he says, every nation there forms an independent entity under its own patriarchate or rabbinate. The Turks rule, but do not set the tone. Today, I would say Turks rule and set the tone, and there's not too many people else other than themselves, because the population of Istanbul became incredibly homogenous, and and the rest of Turkey. And by the way, rest of Greece too. I mean, we'll come to that how that happened. I mean, there was a plurality that we lost, uh, for example, in, in modern day Turkey today. Now, how is it possible that a century ago Istanbul was much more diverse, today it is less? We think that, you know, as time progresses, we become more modern and more open minded and more liberal, right? I mean, that sometimes works that way, but sometimes it doesn't. So I'll try to so explain how these changes took place. How some of that history has been lost. Let's begin with how it all began. So let's ask, what happened to diversity 
and how did it all begin? By how did it all begin, I'll say a few things. I'll take you to the very birth of Islam. Now, I'm a Muslim, and uh, I'm sure we have Muslims in the audience. Just we should make a very brief definition of what Islam is, what kind of religion it is. And I have one simple definition. It is Abrahamic monotheism restated in 7th century Arabia. Before Islam, Arabs believed in many gods that were polytheists. Kaaba, the city in the, uh, the, the cubicle building in the city of Mecca in Arabia, which is today the most sacred shrine in Islam was a pagan pantheon. There were many gods there. There was, there were male gods, there were female gods, there had daughters, they had girlfriends, you know, it was like a Greek pantheon. So Arabs were worshiping these idols. And in one day, a man named Muhammad, who was a merchant in the city at the age of 40, had no idea that he would have a mission like that, heard a voice in the cave telling him, recite in the name of God who created men, he thought he was actually a madman in the beginning, but he was convinced that actually he's a prophet gradually. And then he started to preach that there is no God but the God. And the term the God reads in Arabic as Allah. So Allah is not a specific name for a deity. In Arabic, it is the combination of Al and Ilah, which means the God. So the Quran just says there are no many gods, there's just one God. And who is that God? The Quran empathetically says the God of Abraham. So basically, Islam brought monotheism, which was introduced to the world thousands of years ago before Muslims by Jews and later Christians, with a reinterpretation of monotheism, you know, it's a bit some Trinitarian concept there, brought it to the Arabs first. And then after the Arabs went to the Turks and the Persians and the Indonesians and the Malay and all different kinds of the world, today 1.6 billion Muslims are there. And you, if you ask a Muslim, he, his name can be Abraham or Moses or Isaac or Jacob. Well, there are Arabic versions of those, but these are Old Testament, you know, as you know, uh, characters. So Islam inherited all that tr tradition. And that is why, actually, in the beginning, Muslims saw other monotheists as allies. That's very clear in the Quran. Pagans are the problem, they're the persecutors, they are the ones who has to be converted. Jews and Christians, they are fellow monotheists. There are even verses in the Quran, uh, if, if one verse in the Quran, for example, which promises salvation to all monotheists, not just Muslims. It says, among those who believe, which refer to Muslims, and Jews, and Christians, and the Sabians, which is a contested group, but known as Manichaeans, probably and other monotheistic group in the Middle East. From all of them, all those who believe in God on the last day and who have good deeds will be saved. Now today, not all Muslims accept this idea because they think that verse is abrogated or limited by other, you know, uh, verses or, you know, prophetic sayings, because I think we Muslims like to think we are the only ones that are saved. Generally, people like to think that way. You know. Catholics thought like that for a long time and only in the 20th century, they rethought that position, you know, salvation is only in the church. But actually, if you look at the Quran, you see that salvation is promised to all monotheists. And maybe you can build that up, you know, into the <coughs> all of humanity, but you know, there's some liberal interpretations of that. So there's that whole diversity. So, uh, and Islam began like that, and it had its own battles with the pagans. And a lot of the conflicts in the Quran between the Muslims and the unbelievers, that's actually with the pagans of Mecca who attacked the Muslims first place, and that should be always kept in mind. Islam, though, had a success that other monotheistic religions didn't have at least that fast. That was political power. Uh, I mean, Judaism began and continued as the faith of the Israelites, a, a certain people in a certain place. Uh, Christianity spread to the whole world, but gradually as civil and only with the Roman Empire it became state religion in the fourth century. Islam just accomplished, had achieved political power right from the beginning, right from the time of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, that's why when people ask me, like, how do you compare Prophet Muhammad to whom? I say he's Moses and Joshua combined together from the Old Testament terms. And uh, that political power 
is seen typically by most Muslims as a great blessing. But I think sometimes we should see it as a curse because it brought us a lot of internal conflict and uh, troubles and all the Sunni Shia divisions and all that come from that. So I think we should now reimagine Islam separate from political power. But anyway, that's a different, you know, that's a kind of a liberal argument, progressive argument there. Let's still see what happened. Islam basically, after Prophet Muhammad passed away, it was in Arabia, then it started to spread. The conquests, Muslim armies created an empire stretching from Spain to India in just a century. Now that's one of the greatest expansions in the world. And it's a conquest, so it was done by the sword. But, uh, so we should acknowledge that fact, yes, it was a conquest. It was, and whether the Quran actually blesses aggressive war or not, that's all disputed. Some people think it only blesses defensive war, but it was interpreted in the medieval era as conquest as well. It happened. But the question is, Islam spread by the sword, I admit that, Islamic rule. But people in the conver uh, conquered territories were not forced to convert into Islam, especially if they were Jews and Christians. If they were pagans, that was not a very you know, accepted faith. So paganism basically died out in Arabia. We don't know exactly how, but paganism didn't live. But Jews and Christians were given the absolute guarantee that they can remain as Jews and Christians. Uh, you can, I mean, that's why, I mean, I'll say this is the page of the Quran, by the way, I forgot to show that slide. So this is the great territory that in which Islam expanded. Jewish and Christian communities ex uh, existed. Actually, the Quran gave certain injunctions showing that a social life between Jews, Muslims, and Christians is very possible. One of those. Dietary laws. The Quran bans Muslims from eating the food of pagans. Why? Well, they might have slaughtered an animal for a god, idol, right? I mean, you don't want an animal slaughtered for Ubal, you know, the Arab god, of, you know, like Zeus. Uh, but obviously, Jews or Christians wouldn't do that, so you can eat their food. Christians complicated the scene by adding a pork and, you know, a lot of. You know, not, with Paul, you know, they took the you know, step of abandoning some of the Mosaic law. But still, Jews and Jewish and Christian food is a, a allowed in, Quran, in the Quran. And today, that is why still conservative Muslims are not comfortable with any food in the West. They safely go for kosher. If it is good for Jews, it's good for us. And kosher is obviously halal as well. Uh, the Quran allowed Muslim men to marry Jews and Christians. Again, not pagans, you can't marry the pagans. They, I mean, and even that should be rethought, maybe, but Jews and Christians have been always allowed to marry. The other way around wasn't allowed. I mean, uh, a Muslim woman marrying a, Muslim, a Jewish or Christian man was not allowed. I think because it was assumed that man is always the dominant figure in the family, so maybe it can force the woman to convert and so on and so forth, to take the guarantee there, that was the approach. But I'm happy to see, for example, recently Tunisia allowing that as well. So there's you know, some progress going on. But it's interesting that the Quran allowed these. So anyway, in this whole territory, major territory, Christians and Jews are allowed. That's why you still have Arab Christians in Palestine. You still have Arab Christians in India, the Copts. That's why you still have Arab Christians in Iraq and Syria. And some of those Christians, unfortunately, lately have been attacked by ISIS and have been eradicated from Mosul, for example. And that is horrible, and we should stand up against that. But we should also know that before this notorious group called ISIS, those Christians existed under Islamic states for 14 centuries before that. Now, Jews and Christians under Islamic rule were not equal. We should see that, acknowledge that. They did not have equal rights. They had a status called the me. Have you heard this term? And this term has been recently disputed a lot, you know, condemned as, you know, inequality that Islam brought to Jews and Christians and so on and so forth. But we should see it in its own historical context. In the medieval era, just allowing, tolerating a religious community to, to worship in the way it wanted was a very liberal thing to do. Uh, Jews always did not have that chance in Europe, for example. That's why when they were persecuted in Europe, some of the Jews came to the Islamic lands, including the Ottoman Empire. So the status did not give equality. It did not allow Jews and Christians to have the same legal status with Muslims. 
they couldn't be statesmen, they couldn't be in the military, they had to pay an extra tax, there were limitations, but at that time, it was a progressive status. Now, I want to say a few more things about how this story comes to our, you know, connection to Istanbul, you know, the, the Ottoman story I want to connect. The Dhimmi legal status continued uh, throughout the Islamic history. In the Ottoman Empire, it took a more mature form called the millet system. The millet in Arabic and Turkish means nation. So the millet system, the system of nations, because Ottomans perceive different communities as nations, so they introduced a system, all these nations could co under which they could coexist. And that actually became as very established by the conquest of Istanbul in 1453. And we have a painting here, uh, Ottoman Sultan Fatih Mehmed, the conqueror of Istanbul, giving a firman, an edict, a blessing to the patriarchate Gennadius II. He was the Orthodox patriarchate in the city, in Constantinople, before the conquest. And the Orthodox Christians thought that when the Turks come, they will just slaughter us, probably. But no, Ottomans come, they took the city, they converted St. Sophia into a mosque, so they took certain things. It was not, you know, a full equality of the rules. But besides that, they allowed the Orthodox, they blessed the Orthodox Church. That's why today, still, the Orthodox Church, called the Ecumenical Patriarchate, existed under the Ottoman Empire and then the Republic of Turkey until today. The, the Ecumenical Patriarchate actually had its biggest problems under the Republic of Turkey, not the Ottoman Empire, because of the tensions with Greece and the nationalist attitudes the Turkish Republic has taken against the Turks, not under the Ottoman Empire. Now, so the Ottomans established the Greek Orthodox Church. They also established another patriarchate in Istanbul, and that's very little notice. The Armenian Patriarchate. Uh, because, and this is interesting because before the Turks conquered Istanbul, the Armenians didn't have a presence in Constantinople. Why? Because the Armenians, according to the Orthodox, were heretics. But for Ottomans, these are all different kinds of Christians. We don't care about all the divisions among them. So the Ottomans established the Armenian Patriarchate in Istanbul, which is still there, and that's why its founding date is. 1461, uh, eight years after the conquest of Istanbul, the Armenian Patriarchate was established. So you had the Orthodox Christians and you had the Armenians. The Ottomans were lacking another serious important religious community, the Jewish community. And they came. They came a few decades after. They came in the year 1492. 1492 is a very fateful year in world history, probably you all are familiar. We know that Christopher Columbus set sail to US and found America, that's why we're having this conference in Brooklyn today, probably. Uh, but something else happened, I mean, that's a nice part of the story, but in Spain, with the Reconquista, Reconquest of Spain by the Catholic Kingdom, the Muslim Spain basically vanished that year, and Jewish, the Jews in Spain were given two choices, convert or die. Or go away, you know, basically. So most of them decided to leave Spain, and where do they go to find religious freedom? Well, the U.S. was not established yet, you know, the Statue of Liberty, and that would come later. At the time, there was the Ottoman Empire, and it, again, for the Ottoman Empire, these are Ahl Kitab, the people of the book, uh, Jews and Christians. So they were welcome, and the Turkish Jews uh, celebrated this Ottoman welcome of the Jewish community. Uh, in 1992, with a foundation they called the 500th, the 15th, 500th year anniversary foundation. And uh, there's a painting made by a great Turkish uh, painter in that. It's a bad one, but I want to show you here, I mean, in terms of the colors. Here are Turkish Jews being welcomed by Sultan Bayezid, the son of Sultan Mehmet, uh, soon after, Sephardic Jews, soon after they were expelled from uh, Spain. And the Turkish Jewish community have thrived uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, when the Jewish communities in the Middle East suffered from anti Semitism until the 20th century, the root of that was generally not Islam, but some views coming from Europe. For example, in 19, uh, sorry, in 1840, the first blood libel in the Muslim world broke out in Damascus. 
You know what the blood libel is? It's a insane libel thrown out against Jews by medieval Christians, some medieval Christians, and Jews are targeted for that. Muslims didn't know that. This first came to Damascus by Christian missionaries, and the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Majid has an edict, Farman, condemning this and protecting our Jewish you know, subjects against attacks like this. So actually Jews felt more comfortable in the Ottoman lands compared to Europe until the 20th century, basically, by and large. Now, I want to show you one more photo. Uh, actually, before this, I want to, okay, go forget the photo. Um, I told you that Jews and Christians were not equal citizens. So that's a shortcoming of the Islamic tradition we should see today. We should not continue in a modern society, obviously. Uh, but, in the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire took some important reforms as well, reforms of its own classical system. Ideas from the French Enlightenment, French Revolution, were coming, and especially Balkan nations were being inspired by these. And Ottoman peoples demanded equality, musalva, you know, as it's called, something new. What is this equality? They demanded something called hurriya, freedom. What does this exactly mean? So the Ottoman Empire started to think about these issues. And that led to, ultimately, some significant reforms in the Ottoman system. Uh, first came the Tanzimat reform in 1839. Tanzimat re means reorganization, but it means reform in a broad sense, which actually guaranteed the rights of all subjects of the empire, you know, property rights and all that, which was important. But ultimately came the uh, reform edit, the Slahat Farman of 1856, in which Jews and Christians were declared equal citizens of the empire. And actually, it was even said, hurtful words will not be used against them. Kind of hateful speech, you know, as we would understand today. And, and uh, that was declared all across the empire. The Ottomans did this partly to win sympathy from Western powers, partly to appease the rebellions and so on and so forth. But it's significant that they did this under the caliphate. So this was the Sunni caliphate, the most powerful authority of Islam, which took these reforms. And ultimately, these reforms led to the Ottoman Constitution of 1876. The Constitution declared all Ottoman citizens, not just subjects, but citizens now, are equal regardless of religion or race. So you could be an Ottoman Jew, Ottoman Christian, Ottoman Armenian, Ottoman Kurd, Ottoman Turk, you're Bosniak, you're all equal. Fez, the red canonical hat, was introduced in the same era, Tanzimat era, as an equal dress code for all Ottomans. Before that, people had different dress codes. So here is the poster I want to show you. This is a painting by Ottoman Greeks sometime in the late 19th century. It shows, it's a kind of an idealized picture, drawing of the Ottoman constitution. The, you see a lady in the middle, her chains are being broken and she's being liberated. She represents the Ottoman homeland, Vatan, as the Ottomans now start to call it. So her chains are being broken because liberty is brought, and liberty referred to the Constitution. So the Constitution was heralded as liberty. And you see there is a, there are people happy at the back. A lot of people happy hugging each other. There are a lot of flags, Turkish flags. Oh, but there's a cross there. There's a blue cross with, and there's a Greek guy with a Greek suit. Because these are all Ottoman citizens who are happy, including the Greeks and everybody. And there is some lady flying up in the air, no headscarf, interestingly. Uh, she's the fairy of liberty, as she was called. And she's holding a banner. It writes, Hurriya, Musabba, and Uhuwa. Or, freedom, liberty, sorry, liberty, egality, fraternity. Which are the French, you know, revolution slogans. I'm not a big fan of some aspects of the French Revolution, but I think those three slogans were the right slogans. Ottomans typically added Musa, uh, Adala to that, and it became a slogan of four concepts. Freedom, fraternity, uh, equality, and justice. And I think these are the four things that Turkey still, unfortunately, lacks badly, and a lot of, like a lot of other countries in the world today. So this was a good dream. It didn't work. The Ottoman constitution was there for two years. It was suspended by Sultan Abdul Hamid. Because he said, we're at time of war, we can't deal with all the parliamentarians making a lot of noise. Uh, you know, war becomes a justification for the suppression of liberty, you know, as a lot of politicians have observed. 
Then the constitution was established in 1908 by the people called Young Turks, but the empire was already crumbling. Came the rebellions, those rebellions made the Turks more radical. Ultimately, for example, after losing all the Balkans to national rebellions, the Ottomans took the disastrous decision of expelling all Armenians in 1915. That gave us the great tragedy of the Armenian people. Whatever it's called, it's disputed. I'm not going to get into that, but it was a certain human tragedy, huge human tragedy that we Turks should understand and be more empathetic. But it should be also understand that it happened in the context of the crumbling empire. And the Armenians before that were flourishing and living in under Ottoman system for centuries. So we should see that lost heritage as well. Now, so therefore, we have a lot of modern troubles in other worlds in this part of the world, in this past century. So modernity is a complicated thing. What are these modern troubles? The first one was nationalism. Nationalism tore apart the Ottoman Empire. And it sounded like a good thing. A lot of new states, right? Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, Iraq, Syria. But these states were all defined by one ethnic group. Bulgaria is for the Bulgarians, was the slogan. What about the non-Bulgarians in Bulgaria? Oh, ethnically cleanse them, Bulgarianize them, expel them, exchange them. All these things happen between Bulgaria and Greece, between Turkey and Bulgaria, between Turkey and Greece, between Iraq and, I mean, just, it's, it's a madness that's been going on and on and on. So, unlike America, which is a land and a lot of people came, these nation states were based on one ethne, one, one identity, and the people who felt in the minority had a lot of troubles. Now, I'll show you a map how this tore the whole region apart. Uh, you see this map of forced displacement of 5 million Muslims and 2 million Christians in 1870 and 1923. All these people were being moved away from one place to another. You see an arrow coming from the Russian side to Anatolia, that is Kafkasia, as we call it, Caucasus. My grand-grand-grandfather was one of the people who were drawn by the Russians. They were called Cherkes, they were people of the Caucasus. They were Muslims who didn't speak Turkish, they were not Turkish. But the Ottoman Empire was the place that Muslims ran to because the empire was crumbling. So they came to. And the Ottoman Empire, that's why, established the first department of refugees in the 19th century to take care of these people. Uh, in 1923, World War was over, these states were established, Turkey and Greece were founded, and we thought the problem is solved. Oh no, Turkey and Greece thought the problem still continues. Because there were more than one million Greeks in Turkey, sorry, there were more than one million Turks in Greece and more than 300,000 Greeks in Anatolia. Still, the nation is not homogenized. Turkey and Greece <coughs> made a population exchange agreement in 1923, and Turkey's Greeks were sent to deported to Greece, and the Turks there were deported to Anatolia so that both countries could be purer. And ethnically more stable. Uh, those people left their homes with their keys in their pockets, hoping that they would go in a year. Or they never went back. Now, some of their children are going back to their villages with tears and, you know, seeing where their grandmothers lived before the nation state came and, you know, tore them apart. So nationalism is one of the great roots of some of the tragedies in our age. This continued in the Balkans in the 90s when Yugoslavia uh, was being torn apart, and Serbs ethnically cleansed the Bosnians, you know. Uh, and, and some of the troubles in the Middle East today that is going between sex are also identity problems similar to these tragedies. Uh, nationalism, one thing. Colonialism is another trouble. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed, most of the post-Ottoman states, with a few exceptions like Turkey and Saudi Arabia, most, almost all of them are colonized. Colonialization made the Western powers, by definition, the enemy, in the eyes of many locals. And Western powers were Christian. So local Christians began to be perceived as the fifth column of the enemy. In the same way that Jews would be later perceived as the fifth column of Israel. So that became another source of bias against minorities, unfortunately. Not a justified bias, but it happened in a historical context. Uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, as I told before, I just want to show you a map of the Jewish communities in the Arab world before 1948, before the establishment of Israel. This is, I took this from an Israeli government website. Uh, 
the red circles show you the number of Jewish communities and the black ones show what is left. So for example, in, in Morocco, there were 200, I can't read it, it is 60,000 something Jews there. Now 3,000 Jews are left. Basically in the whole region, there were 850,000 Jews a century, like half a century ago. Now just 4,000 people have been left. It's another diverse city that, unfortunately, the Arab world, the Muslim world, lost. And then came Islamism. What is Islamism? Islamism was the reaction to some of these troubles, especially colonialism. Having seen the region torn apart and broken into wars and under colonial domination, some Muslims, more conservative ones, said, oh, the solution is to go back to an Islamic golden age and to make society more pious, and to get rid of all the corruptive people within us, and so on. So, so they created the idea of an Islamic utopia. They imagined Islam as an utopian system. They've come to power in a few countries, like Iran, uh, like Sudan, and you know they became already the norm in places like Saudi Arabia. But Islamism, as a, and Islamism abandoned some of the modernizing elements of the 19th century. For example, Islamists did not appreciate the Ottoman reforms of making Jews and Christians equal. Still today, Christian Islamists in Egypt, for example, have a trouble in accepting that the Copts are equal with the Muslims. So it was a reaction to some of these modern issues. And then came the even worse offshoot of Islamism, because Islamism is not necessarily white, it's a political ideology, which is Salafi Jihadism, it's called. So the worst of the worst, the Khmer Rouge of the scene, which is groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So, and they emerged in the past three centuries and they reinterpreted jihad as a justification for attacking innocent civilians, for example, which has no precedent in Islam. In Islam, the idea of jihad always existed. It was always a battle between armies. It was never attacking innocent civilians in a city, but they interpreted it that way and that's the latest trouble we're dealing with. So, what are the lessons? Three simple basic lessons. Not everything that is modern is good. Uh, something can be new, modern, it can be good, it can be bad. I mean, we should not think that everything that is new, not, Nazism was modern in Germany, in the, uh, in the, in the early 20th century. Fascism is modern. Communism is modern. There are good and bad sides of modernity, dark and bright side of enlightenment. Well, but no, tradition has its problems and shortcomings. I mean, the Dhimmi system couldn't have lived. Who would live as a, you know, protected but unequal minority in the world today? Minorities already demanded equality. Women demanded equality. Everybody demanded equality and respect. It couldn't be preserved. What was needed was evolution towards what I call liberal modernity, the brighter side of modernity, of human rights of diversity, of individualism, and pluralism, and respect. So that is something we should work today in the whole corners of the world, including within the West and in the Middle East as well. But I think in every society, you will <coughs> head towards a little modernity only when you appreciate certain things in the tradition, because you build things on tradition. And if you totally deny it and you want to eradicate it, you sometimes end up with worse examples of what you're trying to eradicate. Thank you so much for your attention. We have we have uh, plenty of time for uh, questions. So, uh, uh, any questions? I'm sure, there's some questions out there. Questions, objections, protests. No brain food, exactly. Some of this, this is yeah. Go ahead, yeah, Lauren. I was going to you. Thank you so much. I mean, I have great respect for my country and its education history, but I should say, thank God I'm not a product of it, I guess. 
Um, I didn't learn much of this in our educational history. I mean, I don't know how it is now. I mean, I have not gone to private I mean, primary school for a long time. You know. uh, but the educational system I went through in Turkey, and I know it's very similar in Greece and a lot of countries in the region, is very nationalist. So what you learn is that there are enemies within and without. There are enemies outside, there are enemies within. The outside powers are trying to undermine Turkey. They attacked the Ottoman Empire, they tore us into pieces, and they were minorities who collaborated with them. Finally, we crushed them, thanks to our great leader, Atatürk. But we should all rally behind that national cause. They will come again, we should be ready. Um, and all the problems we have is something somehow created by these outside powers or the treacherous ones inside. Just one example. I don't speak much about that, but Turkey has a famous Kurdish issue. Right? It is a modern issue. I mean, the Ottoman Empire did not have a Kurdish issue. You could be an Ottoman Kurd, nobody would care who you are, and you're Ottoman. Uh, you're a Muslim, and that was your first affiliation. There were a few rebellions in the late Ottoman Empire by some Kurdish tribes who didn't want to pay taxes, but it was mainly about central government control. There was no Kurdish nationalism because the Ottoman Empire was not a nationalist entity. So Kurdish nationalism was born as a reaction to the Turkish Republic. When the Turkish Republic was born, this is Turkey, the land of the Turks. Everybody here is a Turk. Some people said, no, we are not Turks. I mean, I given, uh, speaking of education, uh, now it is abandoned, but when I was going to school, and it's abandoned for a long time, for decades, Every morning, we Turkish students took an oath, the national oath, it's called. So it begins with one line, Türküm, which means I am a Turk. I'm a Turk, I don't mind. But some people in Turkey say, Kurdüm, like I'm a Kurd. No, we took great pains to explain them. Actually, Turks includes you too, but we have to ban your language so you get it better. Like, it didn't work. A century of trying to persuade with different methods, it didn't work. It worked in the sense that there are now citizens of Turkey who are proud to be Kurds, and they don't want a Kurdish state necessarily. I'm glad that you know that synthesis evolved. That happened thanks to some you know openness on the uh, state side as well. But and, and the oath continued, and it ended with this amazing line. It said. Uh, oh, mighty editor, who has given us this day, we will walk relentlessly on your path. A very end. It should be Ataturkist, that's it. And it said, let my existence be a gift to the Turkish existence. Like, that's a kind of, I'm giving my individuality to the totality of the nation, and so on and so forth. So it was a very nationalist, indoctrinative oath. And people like me have argued that that's wrong, and... We should have a more, you know, pluralistic nation. People should not, I mean, people can die for their country if necessary, but you shouldn't think your existence is a gift to the collective existence. And that oath was lifted by the AKP, the current government, and that was the time the AKP was making nice reforms and we all said, great. But now we see the same nationalism re-emerging and just recast, just Ataturk is replaced by the current president. And there are more references to Islam compared to the more secular nationalism of the past, but it's old nationalism again, and there are enemies outside and within. And the people who think differently are typically the enemies within. So that is a very bad, I think, formula. And the thing is, this is, this is you can see all around, you can see in Serbia, same narrative, very strongly. In Greece, that's very interesting. There's an interesting documentary showing the National, national liberation celebrations in Greece and Turkey. Uh, it, I forgot the name of the documentary, but a Turkish filmmaker went to two towns in Greece and Turkey. Both towns celebrate their national liberation. Turks are celebrating the national liberation from the Greek occupation, and Greeks are celebrating the national occupation from the Turkish, national liberation from the Turkish occupation. Ours happened when Greeks occupied Anatolia in 19, 1920, right after World War I. Then we kicked them out. They think we kicked them out when they were Ottomans. So these, 
And when you look at the celebrations, they are very similar. There was this evil enemy who came and occupied us and who attacked our women and so on and so forth. We kicked them out. They might come again. We'll be ready for them. And very similar. Oh, actually, you guys are a part of the same problem. Now, I'm not saying all this to say that we should have lived under empires. Maybe empires were passing. Okay, it was not maybe possible to sustain that. But there could have been a more smooth transition and a more respect to diversity and so on and so forth. Ultimately, militant nationalism won the day in early 20th century. And it's still living us today. And a lot of leaders now today find this helpful to stoke nationalist feelings and to say, I am the man. I'm the man, man to save you from all those evil enemies. We need those evil enemies because I need you know, them to sustain. So this goes on and on. Therefore, I think we need to deconstruct this whole narrative. And Turkey would remain as a Turkish Republic, or we even you know, suggested, not the Turkish nation, but the nation of Turkey, you know, how do you frame that, and so on and so forth. But I mean, I want Turkey to become more inclusive. It, it has become more inclusive to Kurds, actually. I mean, I should grant that. Uh, but now it's politically very divided. People who side with the government and against, and those who are against are seen as Kind of treacherous and so on. That's a very toxic, toxic dynamic in Turkey, and 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 the Sunni Shia tensions in Iraq are actually, in a religious Islam, a continuing fight between identities over control of a you know land of an autocratic state. So it's actually the footnotes of the same problem. Does this answer your question? I actually have a question. Where were you arrested? Oh. What, Malaysia. Malaysia. I was in Malaysia. I was in Malaysia. What did you say in Malaysia that got you arrested and removed from the country? Okay, that's a whole different story. Right? It's a whole different story, but it, 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 it's something that interests me. Uh, um, that was, I think, uh, maybe was that a, su a surprise on your part? That this yeah, I wasn't expecting to be arrested. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, thanks for asking that. That's a different topic, but related. I mean, I got briefly arrested by the Malaysian authorities September in September 2017, like, I don't know, six, seven months ago from now. Um, this happened because in Malaysia, there's an institution called Islamic Renaissance Front. This is a, this is a Muslim initiative trying to insert more liberal ideas into the Malay religious sphere. Uh, and they have me as one of their speakers. They bring me once in a while. They publish my book in Malay, Islam Without Extremes, a Muslim Case for Liberty. I mean, to Malaysia six times in the past nine years with the Islamic Renaissance Front. So we had a lot of conferences and on issues like this or other issues relating to Islam, you know, religious freedom, freedom of speech, and, and how do we advance these values, make them compatible with, you know, the, how do we find their roots in the Quran? So they arrest, they didn't arrest me, so they invited me again to Malaysia in September. I went from Wellesley to Malaysia, which is the exact other end of the planet. 12 hours, it takes a day to go there, I did that. And uh, I was supposed to give a few seminars, lectures. One of them was titled, Does Freedom of Conscience Open the Floodgates of Apostasy? So, so in Malaysia, apostasy is a sensitive issue. You know what apostasy means? Like, leaving your religion. Like, I'm a Muslim, if I decide to become a Christian, or a Buddhist, or California Buddhist, whatever, I become an apostate, right? I, I'm not a Muslim anymore. Now, I'm a Muslim, alhamdulillah, I have no problem with that, but, you know, imagine I change my religion or somebody changes the religion. That's called apostasy. Now, in a liberal society, what do we do to apostates? We don't do anything, right? I mean, it's a choice. We can try to persuade them as fellow believers, you know, see the light again, but you can. Well, apostasy is considered as a crime in classical Islamic law, not in the Quran, but medieval interpretation of Islamic fiqh jurisprudence. And it is a crime punishable by death execution in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Afghanistan, Sudan, probably Yemen, a few places. And now I'm, argue, I'm arguing against that. In Malaysia, Malaysians are moderate. They take pride in being a moderate country, so they don't execute apostates. They send them to a rehabilitation center. So I gave this half an hour lecture saying that this is all wrong. 
I mean, people can change their mind, change their religion. We can try to persuade them, but we shouldn't use any coercion against them. I keep referring to the Quran, the Baqarah 256, I mean, the Quran chapter verse, no compulsion in religion, la ikrah fi din. And I said, there is a basis in the Quran for religious freedom. This banner of apostasy comes from medieval jurisprudence, which had its own context. It doesn't, exp I made a lot of, you know, classical arguments, actually. And, and I said at the end, religion is not something you can police. You know, religion is in the heart. You can't police religion. Now, I said that, and people applauded and they left. And like six serious guys came. And they said, we are the religion police. <laughs> so they showed me their identity cards. And it's literally, their job is religion enforcement officer. That's the guy's job definition. So they said they heard complaints about my talk and they will watch the video and then they will let me know and they ask a few questions and they let me go. And I thought, it's okay, it's done. Then next morning I woke up, they watched the video, they decided I violated the law of teaching Islam without credentials from the state. And they, they summoned me to the religious police headquarters. My host said, just leave the country as soon as possible, we'll deal with this through lawyers. But they realized I'm leaving, so they issued an arrest order. They arrested me at the airport. So I, was, I gave my passport, I was thinking I'll have sparkling water now, but you know, they got me. And ultimately they, they took me from, I was detained 18 hours. They locked me in the religion police headquarters in this cell. Um, they took me to a Sharia court the next day. They questioned how do I there, you know, quote the Quran, la ikrafi di no compulsory religion, without proper authorization. And I said, like, I'm a Muslim, I do quote the Quran all the time. I didn't know. And I said, sorry, I didn't want to break your laws. And I, you know, two hours interrogation. They let me go at the end. And I said, thank you, Amin. But I learned that I was let go thanks to some diplomacy on my behalf. Because uh, I, my host realized I got arrested. They let my wife know about this. My wife told my father in Istanbul, I should... I, okay, I can, I can be open here. My father is a good friend of Turkey's former president, Abdullah Gül. Uh, so he called Mr. Gül, and Gül said, Oh, okay, Malaysian Sultan is my friend, let me call him. So he called the Malay Sultan of Malaysia, and the Sultan of Malaysia told his advisor, Oh, yeah, let this guy go. So he told the court, and the court let me go. So that happened while I was in jail, you know, in time different zones. So in the morning, actually, they were nicer to me, and I said, Well, what's going on? So. Uh, so I was let go thanks to that, but I could have stayed in jail a bit more if the, that didn't happen. And certainly that was a bad night. And the thing is, before boarding on the plane, and by the way, I was in, after all that, the Sultan's advisors hosted me to the plane. So I was given the VIP exit in the next day because they wanted to make it nice. Uh, but I wanted to, before even boarding the plane, still I was in Kuala Lumpur, I wanted to check how they interpret the Quran on that issue. La ikra fi din, no compulsion on religion. Because that's a very famous part of a verse, la no compulsion on religion. And all the, let's say, liberal-minded Muslims, that's kind of our motto, like no compulsion on religion. Now, so I know Saudis do not tolerate that translation, so they insert things into it. I realize, I entered their website, Jakim, they do the same thing. So no compulsion on religion becomes, they add parentheses, no compulsion in religion while accepting Islam. So what is the difference? Well, if you say no compulsion while accepting Islam, it means we're not going to force you to become a Muslim. Okay, that's accepted. So you can remain as a Christian or Jew. But once you are a Muslim, you are under our control. Religion police has authority over you. They will check whether you're fasting or not. They will, if you're drinking alcohol, they, will, they might punish you for that. So it's not between God and you, it's not between you and the police. And if you're apostate, you know, rehabilitate or some, do something about it. But that is not in the worst, they're inserting it to it. Because Islam is not just about the Quran, it's a whole body of jurisprudence built in the medieval era, which actually influenced how even the Quran was interpreted. The Quran is silent on many issues but we have a whole body of literature. And it developed in a certain historical context, we can understand that, but I think we should re-understand it today. But that's precisely that they're angry at, they don't wanna, so that's the story of Malaysia. But Malaysia is a great country, go there, have great food and everything. Just don't bother with religious freedom issues, you know.
Don't mess okay. up with the police, yeah. We have time for one more, one more question. And then we can move over to the, uh, to the uh, reception. Questions, questions, yeah. Uh, unless there are no. Any other questions? Okay, floor is yours. Um, I wonder, I very much appreciate your uh, presentation here, Mustafa. I thought it was brilliant and Thank tremendously you. insightful. I wonder if you have advice for students and for the rest of us who are students of the world trying to understand uh, the movements of political leaders when so much of the rationalization for political moves is in light of an interpretation of history that may be suspect. That a lot of your talk was about reinterpreting assumed history that is fed to us. I wonder if you have thoughts about how we can be critical on the spot, students can be pr critical on the spot of interpretations of history that are used to justify movements in the political sphere today. Thank you so much, great question, and thanks for hosting me here again. Um, well, much of fanaticism comes from a narrative of that we are the victims and there are evil powers who did this to us. And there are some evil powers. I mean, that, there's Holocaust. There's evil in world history. I'm not going to deny that. But a lot of the evil we're speaking about is actually a conflict between two nations. And we suffered what they suffered. And they had their own narrative and us too. Um, what seems like a you know big attack on us for their side, maybe a self-defense, at least try to understand how the other side saw the picture. And because we very much are inclined to think, and we love, and politicians pump that, evil versus good, good versus evil. And if there's a good versus evil dichotomy, we're always the good ones. And they're always the evil ones. And the world is Again, I'm not saying this in an absolute relativism, which I don't agree with, but the world is generally a bit more diverse, a bit more nuanced. What you see, what a country celebrates as liberation is for another country collapse. What, what a country sees as aggression is for another country something else. And at least once you understand that, you have some empathy. It, it's not going to make you deny who you are but you will understand where they're coming from. And then that will create some ground for conversation. Otherwise, it's good and evil. There's only one way to solve that, bomb them, fight them, resist them, and, and so on and so forth. Whereas, I mean, one example, Kurds, Turkey's quintessential issue, right? Why did we have repeated Kurdish rebellions in Turkish history? Now, the national education system, read that, tells you that there are evil powers which want to divide us, and there are treacherous elements that collaborate with them. It doesn't say, we made the Kurds unhappy by doing these wrong things. And some of them exaggerated that and took that to a wrong level of violence, which should be opposed and condemned. But there's a road to that, and we have a share in making that. Now, once you understand that, Okay, maybe we can solve this problem by some reforms, by having some conversation with the moderates, maybe on their side at least, to initiate. Otherwise, you know, just fight them until all the terrorists are er eradicated. That's what our previous generals were saying. Now the current government is saying the same thing. And the, I'll tell you, they are never eradicated. You kill one guy, his nephew wants to take his revenge in these conflicts. And it just goes on like that. And that. And, that's why in conflicts, and of course, there can be political leaders who take the risk of uh, reaching out to the other side, and sometimes even at the, against the biases of their own societies, they're good leaders. Some leaders just pump up the biases of their own society, make them more hateful, and surf on that hatred. And unfortunately, there are a lot of leaders in the world today who do that in different four corners of the world. And I would strongly recommend looking at those leaders with a more, with a more critical eye. Okay, first, first, you have a question? Yeah. One quick question, and then, yep, we have like four minutes, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, what do you think is the reason for why the meaning of Shema just changed over? Why the meaning of Jihad changed? Yeah, like interpretation, why is it different interpretation? Well, modernization. <laughs> Globalization, basically, 
these jihadi groups, as they call themselves now, I mean, it began with Al Qaeda, and it just, of course, I mean, even even Al Qaeda remained moderate compared to ISIS in certain cases, and there are other groups like Boko Haram, Al Shabaab. They uh, they justified attacks on civilians, and this was a big theological debate in that Salafi community, Salafi jihadi community, in the 70s and 80s. They basically brought arguments from the Marxist guerrilla tradition. I mean, the enemy is so powerful in a confrontation, we can't defeat them, we have hurt the enemy, uh, so we do that by soft targets and so on and so forth. So it was kind of a military logic they brought into the scene. Whereas traditional scholars point to two Prophet Muhammad sayings. For example, Prophet Muhammad has a famous hadith saying, Fight in the name of God, but do not attack the women, children, elderly, do not attack the monks, do not cut trees. Based on those sayings, medieval Islamic scholars developed a jurisprudence of jihad war. Based on that, for example, they did, most jurists did not allow using catapults to throw rocks into cities. Because that would hit civilians, and it was haram to kill the civilians. Now, the idea that civilians are free target, that is a very fairly recent phenomenon. It began in the late 70s, 80s. First, attacks against Israel civilians, totally unjustified. Then attacks against Americans, obviously. On the, so all that, but that's a bastardization of, I think, notion of jihad. So while we should condemn the people who call themselves jihadists, we should also say that they are even not jihadists in a proper sense. Jihad is armies fighting each other. And for example, the better examples of jihad, you can find in Salahatin Ayyub, for example, who fought the Crusaders, never attacked Crusader civilians. He made a very clear distinction between Crusaders and Orthodox Christians. Richard the Lionheart slaughtered male, female, women, beheaded them, and Richard the Lionheart is a famous man in the UK, but he was not a very nice uh, person uh, when it comes to rule the war. Salat and Ayyubi didn't do that, for example. So there are good examples in Islamic history we can point to saying that this is the kind of notion of I do believe that if you're attacked, you can defend yourself. I mean, I believe that Sarajevans had the right to defend themselves against the Serbian onslaught in the 90s, for example. My wife is a Sarajevan, so I know that. Uh, so I'm not an absolute pacifist, but it should be a rule that uh, defensive war, and it should have rules. It should be against aggression, but certainly not an aggression. It should not be an aggression against the civilians. And that's really a new interpretation, bastardized. Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I would like to, first of all, thank also the history department, thank the president's office, thank the, the dean's office, and also very much thanks to the Wolf Institute for putting this on.